I should add that what happens at the end of this process, when, as is now the case across Europe and much of East Asia, fertility remains stubbornly below replacement, is the subject for an entirely separate lecture series. There was not always academic consensus on the relationship between population growth and economic development, and there may not even be consensus today, but the research findings I've just described are now widely accepted by development economists, and there is certainly broader agreement today than at any point since the 1970s. Staying for the moment at the macro level, there is also increasing agreement that high rates of population growth can have significantly negative consequences for the environment. The data are far from conclusive on such matters as climate change and global warming. Certainly the interplay of sheer human numbers and consumption patterns must be acknowledged and better understood, but there is growing evidence that the relationship is real and that it is important. There is far greater consensus among scientists on the impact of rapid population growth on such issues as fresh water supplies, deforestation, soil erosion and depletion, biological diversity and species extinction, and air and water pollution. Other things equal, rapid population growth clearly makes it harder for countries to protect and preserve their natural environments and habitats. Finally, at the societal level, there is the issue of civil unrest and disruption. A rapidly growing population of poorly fed, poorly educated, and unemployed young people, especially young men, is a recipe for civil disorder born out of frustration and despair. Such young people are natural and willing recruits to radical political movements or simply violent manifestations of social collapse. One need look no further than the high fertility regions of the Middle East or much of East, Central, and West Africa to find countries which either are experiencing or have recently known political violence and social upheaval. I believe it's naive to think that high fertility and youthful age structures have nothing to do with this. For many years, economists looked at the high fertility of poor people and said that it was a natural response to poverty. Poor people with few resources other than children needed those children as a source of labor and old age security. The costs of children in a subsistence environment were relatively low and their contributions to household well-being were significant. More recently, thinking about this relationship has changed. First, we have discovered that a great deal of childbearing of poor people, especially women, is unintended and unwanted. Seeing children as a net resource is a distinctly male construct. 30 years of household level surveys in scores of nations have now shown us extremely high levels of unmet need for contraception, which, if satisfied, would result in considerably lower fertility by as much as a whole child in much of Africa. Furthermore, researchers are increasingly documenting that families that successfully reduce fertility do considerably better economically on average than families that don't. In empirical studies in places as diverse as rural Bangladesh and urban Brazil, economic researchers find that lower fertility results in higher household incomes and, low, and, and overall living standards. Looking in particular at the Bangladesh findings, which are based on two decades of data from a true experiment, the Matlab experiment, it is strikingly clear that families in the program villages, that is the experimental villages, who received family planning services and used them to limit their fertility, have done considerably better in terms of their incomes and overall living standards than families in the so-called control villages, where family planning services were not available. In other words, if one looks at the impact of fertility on poverty, rather than at the impact of poverty on fertility, it leads to quite different conclusions. Poverty reduction, of course, lies at the heart of the Millennium Development Goals. But no matter which of the MDGs one examines, education, child health, maternal health, HIV AIDS, gender equality, food security, the relationship with fertility is clear and direct. 
I've already mentioned how rapid population growth makes it harder for governments to provide educational and health facilities. High fertility makes it harder for families to send all their kids to school, much less to get them immunized or properly cared for when they are sick and need medicine. A child born into a family of three or more children, especially if the birth comes less than 24 months after the last child was born, is much more likely to die before the age of five than a child born into a smaller family and three or more years after the last one. In other words, the number and spacing of children is critical to child survival. A mother who delays childbearing until her late 20s and who stops before she reaches her 40s is far likelier to survive to, to old age than a mother who starts sooner or ends later. Also, the fewer the births, the higher the chances of avoiding premature death. Women who marry later, delay childbearing, and have fewer children are far more likely to find work outside the home and contribute to household income and quality of life. They are more likely to get a decent education and to participate on more equal terms in family decision making. And that goes for better educated men too. And of course, no factor is more important than female education when it comes to reducing fertility. Female education and reduced fertility may be the best example of mutually reinforcing outcomes in the entire literature of development. No matter how you look at it, it's hard to escape the conclusion that lower fertility helps to reduce poverty and contributes to the achievement of every one of the MDGs. I don't believe that reducing rapid population growth and high fertility is a panacea, what in my country sometimes called a silver bullet, although I do wish we would talk less about bullets in the United <laughs> States. <clears throat> there are a few shortcuts and no easy answers in development. But I do believe firmly that in places where population is growing very rapidly and where fertility is especially high, it would be far easier to improve living standards and to stimulate environmentally sustainable and sustained economic growth if we could at least satisfy the unmet need for contraception and the other simple and relatively inexpensive services that comprise reproductive health. We know how to do this, and we have shown in many countries around the world how relatively simple and inexpensive high-quality reproductive health can be. By simply restoring reproductive health to a position of high priority within our efforts to expand basic health services and strengthen primary care systems, we could make giant strides toward realization of the MDGs and our collective dream of a world free of extreme poverty. I thank you for your kind attention, and I look very much forward now to commentary by Minister Kunders and to your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sending. I'm 